Do you know your GCSE physics required practicals for paper two? They come up most years in one form or another, and they consist of force and extension, acceleration, waves, such as ripple tank and vibrating string, infrared radiation, and if you do separate science, it's reflection and refraction. So we're gonna go through some exam questions here that are gonna talk through six mark methods um, for each of these. Also gonna talk through things like variables, what graphs you should need to plot, how do we know the experiment is being as accurate as it can, what are any safety considerations, um, errors, and uncertainty. So I would definitely learn these practicals inside out. And they also help you uh, revise content as well. So let's get started. This question is all about Hooke's law. Um, basically, how do I find the spring constant of a spring by varying the force and measuring the extension? We've got to write a method and we've got to put in a cause of inaccuracy. So I'm going to draw a diagram first of all, uh, just to remind you what's going on. It's always a good idea to draw a diagram. If you can, you'll never lose marks for it. Um, so we've got two clamps, uh, one with a ruler or a meter stick clamp next to it. Um, the other one has got a spring. Now, um, at the minute, my spring has got nothing on it. If I draw some masses added onto it, um, we can then start to write a method and figure out um, how we'd go about doing this. So first step, we're gonna step up, set up the clamp stand um, as I've just drawn there. I'm not gonna elaborate on that anymore um, because I've already drawn it. So with one ruler and one with a clamp, uh, with a spring in the other clamp. Uh, next, uh, we're gonna record the reading on the meter ruler level with the bottom of the spring. Now my ruler doesn't start at zero where the spring is, so I've gotta record this reading on the meter ruler first um, before I can do anything else. Next what I'm gonna do is hang a two Newton weight from the spring. Now this is important, the table has values in it, you have to mention those values. So it goes from zero, two, four, six, eight, ten 10 Newtons. Um, you cannot just say add some masses, you've gotta be specific. Then we've got to record the new position on the bottom of the spring on the ruler. And to calculate the extension for my setup, I'm gonna do the final uh, length minus the initial length. Then I add two more weights each time and repeat those steps. It's really silly to not get marks for not including a source of inaccuracy if they tell you that in the question. So inaccuracies in this question, there's a couple you can choose from. Uh, the main one is how you measure the extension by not measuring at eye level. If you're slightly below or slightly above it, it'll read slightly differently. Um, you could say something like, if you also, if you don't uh, clamp the ruler vertically, that might mean your extension is not gonna be accurate either. The next part is all about how do I measure it for, why do I measure it for five different forces rather than one? Um, anything that talks about repeats um, is to do with being more accurate, it's identifying anomalies um, um, in your results. On the following page, we've got a nice graph set up with uh, extension and force. So let's plot those results in from the table. That should be a nice, easy couple of marks in your exam. Um, next, we've got to write down the equation that links extension, force, and spring constant. Um, again, it's going to be just the one from your equation sheet, F equals K times E. Um, and this time, we've got to work out the spring constant of this spring. Um, now, it's four marks, which might make you think that's a lot of marks um, here. Well, there's a couple of things we've got to do. We've got to use the full um, value um of the full line of best fit on your graph so we've got to use 10 whole newtons that's as far as our line goes and 20 centimeters 20 centimeters needs to be into meters uh, for this to work so we end up with 10 divided by 0.2 gives us 50 newtons per meter Last question uh, talks about things being directly proportional. So the student says um, the extension is directly proportional to the force applied. Um, does it obey this? Well, the idea is it is directly proportional because it's a straight line and it goes through the origin. It's worth noting that there's lots of different ways to do this practical. So I'm gonna go through the way which we do it in my school and I think it's the easiest way to explain, um, but there might be other ones uh, to use as well. So in the extra equipment we need, the diagram looks a bit blank at the minute. We need to include some string on the end of the car attached to some masses on a mass hanger um, via a pulley, which is sort of a circular piece of metal where the string goes over the top of it. So how we go about doing this method, first of all, is by explaining what equipment do I add? So I'm adding the string to the car and attach it to the mass hanger uh, over the pulley clamped at the end of the table. Next thing to talk about is how do I measure the acceleration? Now I'm gonna measure the acceleration by doing the change in velocity divided by time. To measure the time is straightforward, I just need a stop clock, but to measure the change in velocity, we need to use a new piece of equipment um, called some light gates. So I'm gonna let go of the car, and I'm gonna time how long it takes to travel between um, the two light gates. That gives me my time. Now, when I do that, the light gates measure the change in velocity. They're kind of like speed cameras. So I'm gonna measure this change in velocity uh, between those two points using the light gates, and then measure the time taken, as we've just said. Um, I'm gonna divide them using the equation to find the acceleration. So that's gonna give me my acceleration. That's almost all my method space done just by one thing. That's why this practical is a tricky one to remember. 
To vary the force, that's the easy bit. I'm going to add masses to the hanger um, and then basically repeat for um, different masses. I don't have any values in my question here, so I don't need to mention what the masses are, uh, but repeat for different uh, masses. And to find the weight, I need to do the mass um, times by g, which is 9.8 on planet Earth, to find the force each time. Um, then I'm going to repeat lots of different masses. That's how I'd find the relationship. Over the page then, uh, we've got some results for an investigation. Um, F, how does acceleration be, uh, proportional to force? That's Newton's second law, F equals MA. Now, um, this question down below, I've got to determine the acceleration of the trolley. Um, I don't have the mass, so I can't use this equation. So what I'm going to use is proportions, okay? It tells us the two things, acceleration and force, are proportional. Um, so that means the force um, is 1.2, and it goes up to 3.6. The acceleration from the table is 1.6, so it must go up by the same fraction or by the same amount. Um, so hopefully we can see 1.2 to 3.6 is times by 3. Acceleration therefore also has to times by 3, which gives us 4.8 meters per second squared. Over on the final page of this question, um, we've got a nice, it should be easy three marks for doing a little bit of uh, FIFA, a little bit of uh, rearranging an equation. F equals M times A. Plug in my values for F, uh, 0.42. M I don't know. A is 1.2. So therefore I divide both sides by 0.12, uh, which gives me a mass of 0.35 kilograms, which, sanity check, does it make sense? Well, yeah, it's a toy car. It makes sense. It's not more than a kilogram. That sounds about right here. Most teachers I know don't really like this practical. It's a ripple tank and it's used to measure uh, the speed of water waves. This question says describe how the frequency and wavelength of the water waves in the ripple tank can be measured accurately. So frequency is the number of waves per second. So how we'd measure it accurately is we count the number of waves passing a point in let's say 10 seconds. It could be 30, it could be 60. Um, but either way you're going to time it using a stop clock. Um, once you've counted that amount you then need to find the frequency you divide the number um, of waves by 10 in this case to make it in one second. Um, it could be by 30 if you do 30 seconds, but here it's 10, so I'm going to stick with 10. To find the wavelength, uh, wavelength we're going to need a ruler, um, so we're going to place the ruler next to the waves. Um, easiest way to do it is to take a photo um, because the waves are moving quite quickly. You've got to um, stop, stop them so you can measure them. Count the number of waves in the picture, um, then measure the length, and then divide the distance by the number of waves. That's how you do it accurately. You can't just do it for one wave, otherwise that's an area inaccurate way of doing it because they're so small okay we've got some values down here we're going to work out the wave speed for next and uh, wave speed from your equation sheet is frequency times wavelength um, and it asks for the mean that's why it's four marks so the mean frequency we can work out by adding the values together and dividing by three which gives us 9.5 hertz the mean wavelength um, add the values together of the table below um, and you divide by three again it gives us 0.02 meters so timesing those two values together to give us the overall wave speed 9.5 times by 0.02 gives us a mean wave speed of 0.19 meters per second. Now, classic question next about the advantage of taking repeat readings when calculating a mean. This should be off the top of your head. Any science is the same answer. The idea is it reduces the effect of anomalies, or you could say you can remove the anomalies before finding the mean. Next question is all about how does depth affect um, the waves in the water. Um, so it says uh, they get deeper and it says they get faster. How does it affect the wavelength? So if, if we look at this equation here, um, when waves pass from shallow to deep, um, they actually refract. Um, so the speed changes. Here the speed increases. Frequency doesn't change. That means the wavelength does change. So if, if the speed of the wave goes up, that means the wavelength goes up. Um, and as you can see, I'm writing here, um, that's because uh, the frequency is constant. So those two factors are proportional to each other. So there you go, the rats ripple tanks. That wasn't too bad, was it? Uh, make sure you revise this one because it'll be a practical that people will forget to revise. And if it comes up, you want to make sure you know what you're doing with it. The first stage is to look at the setup we've got. So we've got a string uh, with a vibration generator that's making our waves. The waves go on this diagram from right to left, hit the bridge, go back, and they form this sort of loopy pattern here. So the first question is relatively straightforward. To measure the wavelength of 80 centimeters, uh, we have to use a meter ruler to be able to do that. Next bit is actually not too bad either because either, we've got the equation from the equation sheet um, to find the speed. We've got to do the frequency times by the wavelength. The frequency it tells us in the question is 55 and actually the wavelength is in the question as well because every two loops um, is one wavelength. The wave goes up, down, then back up again. Um, all we need to do is convert it to meters. Um, so 80 centimeters is 0.8 meters, um, which if I times those two things together, um, I'm going to get a speed of 44 meters per second.
Over onto the rest of the question, um, it says the frequency of the signal generator is increased, um, the wavelength changes. How could the apparatus be adjusted to show one complete wave? You've really got to use your imagination here, okay? If I increase the frequency, the wavelength decreases, what that means is I'll get more loops shown um, on this length of the string. So if I've got more loops, to show one complete wave, that means I need to show two uh, loops, that means I need to remove this uh, bridge thing here. If I move the bridge sort of further to the right, um, then I'm going to be able to see that because the wavelength has gone down, I can then show one whole wavelength or two loops um, on maybe let's say half of that length, for example. It doesn't give us any numbers, so we just need to say move the bridge closer to the vibration generator. Okay, lastly for this bit of the question, um, it says a student wants to investigate the spring, how it is affected by the tension. Now, this is something which you wouldn't have been expected to do in class. It's one of those questions where they're using a required practical, asking you something slightly different about it. So to vary the tension, we basically place masses on the hanger. That's going to increase the tension on the string. So I'd say something like place one mass on the hanger, then record the frequency on the signal generator um, and measure the length of two loops um, using the meter ruler. Then to calculate the speed, I'm going to do speed speed equals frequency times my wavelength to calculate the speed. Now, how does the tension affect it? I've got to vary the tension, so I'm going to add additional masses to increase the tension, then repeat the stage above. So I'm going to look for those two loops again and measure each one, find the speed using frequency times wavelength, um, but I don't need to write that all again, so we're all good just to say repeat the original stages. In this question from 2023, we've got a practical all about infrared radiation. Uh, we've got silver and black colored flask, we've got a kettle of cold water, and we've got a hypothesis. Now, the hypothesis says that the black colored flask will emit more infrared than the silver flask during 10 minutes of cooling. Now, 10 minutes of cooling isn't, uh, doesn't seem very important, but if you don't refer to it in your answer, it means you haven't read the question, you're not looked at the hypothesis properly. So I help off this, if you didn't know, it's just what you think might happen. Um, the rest is just writing down the method for this practical and catering it towards this question. So what we do first of all is use a measuring cylinder to measure equal volumes of water from the boiled kettle and pour them into each flask. Then put a thermometer inside um, and then what we're going to do is basically leave it 10 minutes after we've recorded the temperature. So we're going to record the initial temperature on the thermometer, then we're going to start a stopwatch and we don't have that in the um, experiment, it says we've got some of the equipment used, so starting a stopwatch and wait for 10 minutes um, before recording the final temperature, so the temperature again on the thermometer. So we should know at this point infrared radiation um, for it to decrease means the temperature of the hot water is going to go down. So we need to calculate the decrease in temperature for both flasks um, and whichever one has the highest temperature decrease, so the highest temperature decrease, um, that means that it's going to be have the um, highest amount of infrared being emitted, so therefore the hypothesis is correct. So for this question you cannot get six marks unless you mention, link it back to the hypothesis. What are you expecting to happen if the hypothesis is true? So the black one has the largest decrease in temperature um, for the hypothesis to be correct. Now an alternative you can use at this point is instead of a thermometer you can use an infrared detector, um, make sure you use it at the same distance from each flask. They give you the option in, in this question, you don't, um, they don't give you the thermometer or the infrared so that would also be fine to say. Just to finish off the extra mark here, um, the direction of oscillation of uh, transverse waves is perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer um, as you can see in the diagram I'm kind of quickly drawing out here. Okay, following up the rest of the question, it says, when will the flasks emit their infrared radiation at the greatest rate? Um, that will be during the first minute. That's because there's a highest temperature difference between the flask and the surroundings. Therefore, the gradient's going to be steepest for this bit, as I've shown in the graph here. Next, we've got another um, variant on the practical. Oh, this time we're talking about absorption. So the last one was emission, emitting. Uh, now is absorption. Um, gives you some information. It says they fill out metal cubes of water. They're the same size, different color. Then we put them next to a heater. After 10 minutes, um, we note the results. It says, what is the dependent variable? What is measured? So the results here, you can see I've underlined, it says measure the temperature increase of the water. So it's the temperature increase of the water. That is the dependent variable here. That's what you measure. Now down below we've then got some extra results and we've got four different colors. We've got matte white, shiny white, matte black, shiny black. There are two sort of general conclusions you can make is that the white surfaces, the top two, have the lowest temperature increase um, or you could say the two black ones have the highest um, and also the shiny um, surfaces have a, a lower temperature increase than the um, matte surfaces. Okay, So um, make sure you link it to the table, don't be lazy, make sure you say the heading properly. Okay, 
Right, big long question this one, um, but we've got a nice maths question to finish off. We've got pressure equals force divided by area. So let's um, write down FIFA, let's see what we've got. Um, now we've got um, to find the force here. So I know the pressure is 1,500. The area I don't know, but I do know the length and the width of the cube's base. So it's 0.12 meters times by 0.12 meters gives me 0.0144. So to find the force, I need to times both sides by that value, um, which if I do that gives me a final value of 21.6 newtons. 17 marks, got there in the end. Um, there you go, that's almost a fifth year paper just by one required practical, so make sure you learn them. This practical comes up a lot if you do separate science. Uh, so physics paper two, uh, describe a method to show how a student could get some results in the table, varying the angle of incidence um, of light through a glass block and measuring the angle of refraction. Um, so the method's kind of tricky. It is helpful to use a diagram, so I'd recommend doing that. So we've got a ray box um, shining a glass box. Now I'm gonna to add to the diagram as I go. First things first, for anything to do with refraction or reflection, if you want to measure the angle, um, you need to number one, draw around the glass block and then measure a normal so not a normal is 90 degrees to its surface so you just draw the line in it's a sort of imaginary line you draw on yourself it's not there automatically um, but we need to do it first otherwise we can't talk about angles later so next I'm going to measure an angle of 10 degrees to the normal I'm using a protractor I forgot to mention that earlier but to mention it's somewhere in your method what you're using to measure the angles Next, I'm going to shine the ray block, uh, ray box along this line. So I've got 10 degrees to start off with. That's what it says in my table. Um, and then we're going to mark where the ray exits the block. Now, the ray is going to refract. I can't draw it inside the block because the block's in the way. So I've got to do a couple of X's or um, draw a line where the ray leaves at the block. Next, what I do um, is I've got to remove the block and then what I can join together or join the lines up inside the block. So you can see here, we can see the ray of light is actually bent inside the block. Next what I'm going to do is measure the angle of refraction. The angle of refraction is a tricky one here. It's measured between the normal and the refracted ray. So inside the block that I've just drawn on, this angle here, that's why the diagram is useful, um, using a protractor, what is the angle of refraction? Next, I've got loads of results in the table. I'm just going to repeat the process, increasing the angle of incidence by 10 degrees each time and making sure to measure the angle of refraction in the same way. Things that people often miss out are to uh, make sure to mark where the ray is and then uh, remove the block to join up the lines and by saying a protractor to draw your angles on to make sure you include those. Right, next we've got a graph of results, which is a really good opportunity to do a bit of line of best fit drawing. Um, now I'm going to do it quite quickly here because I'm uh, obviously doing a video. I've got a pen rather than a pencil. Um, but once you plot these points on, we should notice this line is not straight. It is a curved line of best fit, uh, which is what you're aiming for here. Okay, you also have to plot your axes on, which I've not done here, um, but just wanted to show you there's a curved line of best fit we expect for these results. To finish off the question, um, we've got some reflection this time from a mirror. Um, it says draw the normal line. I've just shown you how to do that. 90 degrees to the surface um, and the ray reflects at the same angle it goes in at. If you've got a protractor, draw it on um, as closely as you can, uh, the angle of instance, the angle of reflection. Okay, to finish off this question, we've got a couple of different ways of doing it and uh, exams often like to ask you about accuracy or ways in which one method is better than another. So hopefully we can figure out method A is better than B. We're going to figure two ways and explain them. It's four marks total here. So to compare them, we'd say the ray in A is narrower than in method B, so it makes it easier to judge where the center of the ray is. To be able to measure on the protractor, you need to know where the center of the ray is. If it's too thick, you can't do it. Method A also has a benefit in that it's a fixed protractor um, and it's also larger than method B as we can see here. So that means it's easier to read and it's more accurate. Now both these um, improvements make it more accurate. However, in this mark scheme you only get it, uh, the mark for saying accurate for one of them. Um, so I'd write it down for the second one. So make sure you know those accuracy um, improvements for all the required practicals, not just this one. Because um, if they come up, you want to make sure you know uh, how to answer those questions.